So today's lesson will focus on the particle theory of matter. Here we have a picture of space. Space is kind of a nice view of what it can look like without much matter in it. And space is sort of a good place to figure out where all of our matter comes from because matter is basically composed mainly of hydrogen. Space is the main container of that. So all matter is composed of tiny particles. We know that and we call them atoms, but we've known that for a long time intuitively. These particles interact with one another through collisions and vibrations. Vibrations sort of by extension are collisions, but collisions, so when two particles collide with one another, that's how they interact. They don't do any sort of non-contact interactions. They don't just attract one another. When they collide, they tend to interact. And vibrations as well. So when they kind of bump into each other through vibration, that's how they interact with one another. These particles that we've talked about up here can be either elements, molecules, or compounds. And so these particles in this particle theory can be composed of any one of these three or any mix of these three. In different states, the particles of the substance interact differently. If I'm in a liquid state, my particles will interact differently to if I'm in a solid state or if I'm in a gas state. Each of these has different ways of interacting is why different states have different properties, simply because their particles interact differently. So the particle nature of gases. So the first one we're gonna look at is gases because this is sort of where the particle theory sort of came from. So the kinetic theory of gases is used to predict the physical properties of a gas. So the kinetic theory is just another, an extension of the particle theory. The model assumes that the particles in a gas are well spaced. You can see here they've got a fair bit of space between them and each particle moves in a random direction and at random speed. And that's what this model assumes, that all of the particles are free to move in random directions and free to move at random speeds until they interact with one another. So the only way to change the direction or speed of a particle is for a particle to collide with another particle. If, for instance, this particle and this particle collided, then they would bounce off each other and travel at different speeds and in different directions as well. That's the only way we can change their direction or speed, by them colliding with one another. Now, this theory can explain gas pressure. If you put lots of gas particles into a small container, you get what's called pressure. As the pressure relates to the number of collisions between gas particles and the wall of the container. The wall of the container gets hit by the particles because you know they're traveling at different speeds in random directions. So they hit the wall and then bounce off. Because they hit the wall, there's a momentum change. So a force is imparted on the wall. That force or that distribution of force over the area is what we call pressure. The reason why we can compress a gas is simply because of the huge space between the particles. So as you can see here, there's lots of space between each of these particles. And so if we were to squash the volume down, they would still be able to exist, but they would just have less space to move around. And so we can compress the gas essentially. So you can see here, if we watch these particles, they travel in random directions until they hit each other. And then they tend to also hit the wall and bounce off. And the number of times they hit the wall is related to the pressure in that system. So the more times they hit the wall, the more pressure, the less times they hit the wall, the less pressure. So that's how these collisions affect pressure inside a container. So what about the particle nature of liquids? So the particles of a liquid are much closer together compared to a gas. Okay, so you can see that there's very little space between each of these particles. They're still free to move, like each of these particles is allowed to move wherever they want, but because they're so close together, they're likely to collide with other particles in a very short time. If you're a gas particle, you could spend a long time traveling before you hit anything. You're so close together in a liquid, you're very likely to hit something very, very rapidly. They collide more frequently, so they don't have as much freedom to move as in a gas, but they still are allowed to move, and that's the key. So the lack of space makes liquids almost incompressible. Water is often considered an incompressible liquid. It is slightly compressible, but not by a lot. So as you can see in our animation here, each of these particles is happy to move and collide with things, but the motion is much slower. They can't get around as quickly because they're kind of locked together. The liquid doesn't move as much. It doesn't really exert pressure per se on this container because its movement is so slow. Now what about solids? So we've talked about gases liquids and we've slowly been making our way to solids. So the particles in a solid are very densely packed. You can see here they're quite closely packed and very ordered. Before we had like this liquid which was just a bunch of particles just strewn into a space. These ones have an actual physical structure. They're sort of nicely organized. Now there's only enough space for these particles to vibrate so they can only kind of shake left and right or up and down. Particles then occupy only a fixed position. So because they're so close together they can't swap places with one another. Liquids and gases, you could have particles sort of interchanging their position. But with solids, because they're so tightly 
collected, you only have fixed positions for each particle. Now, due to the fixed position of the particles, solids have a defined volume as well as a defined shape. So because each particle is stuck in one spot, then that substance will have a defined shape. So if you pour a liquid into a teapot, it will take the shape of a teapot, as Bruce Lee once said in a famous interview. It doesn't have a defined shape, nor does a gas have a defined shape. It'll just take the shape of whatever container it's in. But a solid will have a shape, and that is defined by where the particles are in that shape. And as you can see in this diagram, there's an ordered structure again. And if you look very closely, all that's happening is that the particles are kind of just expanding and contracting, and they're just vibrating, okay? They're just opening up and closing. And that's all that can happen in a solid because they're so tightly packed together. Now we'll move on to the question segment, and hopefully you'll be able to see how all these things come together. We've looked at all of these different topics in particle theory, so we'll move on to question one which is why are gases easily compressed? To answer that question, we'll open with this diagram. We'll look at the diagram first, and then we'll look at the text. So you can see here in this diagram, we've got what looks like a water molecule, maybe. This other possibly oxygen molecule could be anything. Could be any diatomic molecule. Now, if you look, there's plenty of free space in the left-hand side when the piston is at the top. Okay, lots of free space for the particles to fill. Now, if I push the piston down, you can see that they're still able to survive, so to speak, but they just occupy less space there's less free space for them to move around. And that is in essence what compression, why gases can be easily compressed. So compression requires that particles are pushed closer together. So when you compress something, you're pushing the particles together. Now in gases, the particles have a lot of empty space, as I mentioned, lots of empty space here. So they can be pushed together more easily because there's lots of empty space anyway. So you can see when we push down, the empty space sort of disappears and it's taken up by gas particles. So the more we compress it, the less empty space we have. And that's really the reason why gases can be easily compressed. How does the kinetic theory explain the fact that the pressure of a gas in a sealed container remains constant indefinitely, provided the volume and temperature are kept constant? So what we're saying is in the ideal, in the kinetic theory of gases, the pressure of a, in a container is the same as long as you keep the, the temperature and the volume the same. The pressure, if the volume and temperature are the same, the pressure will remain at that level all the time. Okay, so here we have this animation once again. Remember that the pressure is related to how many times these particles strike the wall. So they hit the wall and that will be what, I, what we call pressure. If the temperature is the same, then the particles will all be traveling at approximately the average speed of the particles won't change. Because if we increase the temperature, obviously the speed will increase. And so if the speed increases, you've got more likely chance of them hitting the wall because all of a sudden they can move faster. They'll hit the wall more frequently. But if we keep the temperature the same, then they can only move at a certain speed, which is related to the temperature. They'll just hit the wall at the same rate as what they were doing before. Now, additionally, if for instance, now we just cut the volume there, you can see that the particles will have less space. So they'll also hit the wall more frequently. So we can't shrink the volume. So if, if they hit the more wall more frequently, then the pressure will go up. So by, shrink, by keeping the volume the same, we should expect that the pressure stays the same as well. So the collisions between the gas molecules and the container are assumed to be elastic. So that means that when they hit the wall, that essentially no energy is lost by the molecules. So they'll bounce off the walls, creating the same pressure indefinitely. So basically they'll hit the wall and come off and no kinetic energy is sort of lost. They'll hit the wall and come back and they'll be traveling at, they'll have the same kinetic energy as when they hit the wall. Since the velocity and directions of the particles are random, then the proportion of time the particles hit the wall will also be the same as long as the conditions are the same. So you've got to keep the conditions the same, otherwise you can't compare them. Explain why gases spread to occupy the available space. So why does gases spread out to occupy the available space? Okay, so here we have the, the picture again. They travel in all different directions, and that's key. So in a confined space, so a very small space, particles collide very regularly. So they hit each other really rapidly and constantly change directions of motion. So let's say we have this confined space here. If you watch the particles, they just keep banging into each other because they're so big compared to the space. So they keep banging into each other very rapidly. And they'll keep changing their direction because they keep hitting each other. But once the container is expanded, so let's say we took up the board space now, we, up to me, the particles traveling away from the majority of the particles will continue to move in a straight line. Let's say this particle here. If we expand the board space, now it can go down here. But there's no particles in the way. It'll just keep going and going and going until it hits the wall. So it'll keep traveling in a straight line until a container confines them to a particular space. Now the continued collisions of the particles will eventually send more particles away from the group, spreading the gas out to fill the room. So this one has already gone away, but these four are gonna keep hitting each other. 
and eventually one of them's going to hit and send the other one uh, maybe out this way. And it's going to keep going until it hits a wall as well. And that's going to keep happening, which will eventually spread out all the particles. That's why gases always fill up the room, because the collisions in this confined space send the particles outward, and those particles will keep traveling outward until they hit a wall and then come back and sort of interact, which will eventually fill up the room with gas. High pressure water jets are often used for precision machining as a means of cutting through materials like steel. Describe the property of water that facilitates this application. So essentially we use water to cut through steel to make very precision objects. So water is a liquid. Since liquids have closely arranged particles, the liquid is essentially incompressible. So there is a slight amount of compressibility, but it's very, very small. So when a high pressure jet comes into contact with steel, it cuts through the steel since the incompressibility of the water and the pressure of the, of the jet overcome the bonds in the steel. The pressure of the jet actually forces the water through the steel, essentially cuts through the steel, and that allows the water jet to cut through the steel. Okay, so it's a very, very cool application of water jets that you can cut steel with them. So it's a very impressive use of water. Changes in temperature by heat transfer occur rapidly in solids, but slowly in gases. Explain why this is so with reference to the particle theory of matter. Temperature is related to the motion of the particles. So the more motion, more particles moving you have, the higher the temperature. So here we have the solid and they're vibrating. That's their method of motion, they vibrate. So temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles. In order to move that energy, particles need to collide. So in order for this particle to give its energy to the next particle, it needs to interact with it and they interact by hitting each other. So in a solid, the close spacing means the vibrations caused by one particle can be easily transferred to another particle. So you can see this vibration, this particle vibrating here, can, be, can send the vibrations this way. And then this one can vibrate into this one and this one. And you can see the vibrations can be sent very quickly because they're so closely packed together. In a gas, however, the particles are widely spaced and thus the particles need to travel great distances before interacting with another particle, which obviously takes up time. So you can see that the temperature will move a lot slower or the temperature change will move much slower because the particles just take longer to interact with each other compared to a solid. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on the particle theory of matter. We looked at the particle theory in its entirety. Then we looked at each state of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. And we looked at how the particle theory sort of explains some of their properties. So hopefully you've learned something about the particle theory. And in future, we'll be looking at the atomic structure and how atoms interact with each other. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.